The goal of this video is to introduce you to for loops. For loops are a way to repeat a set of MATLAB code for a specified number of times. For loops and if statements are probably the two most commonly used control statements. I will also show you how to create nested control statements including loops inside loops and if statements inside loops. So let's start with a simple loop. The conditional part of this loop is a vector that tells MATLAB the number of times to repeat the loop and change the values inside the loop. This variable is called either the looping variable or the counting variable. Here I specify that it should go from 1 to 10 using the colon operator. MATLAB will then run this code, all the code between 4 and end, 10 times, changing the value of counting variable each time. Note that you don't need to update the counting variable explicitly in the code. MATLAB does it automatically. So now we can run this code. And we see the counting variable gets displayed at each iteration of this for loop. And it stops after 10 times. Here's another example that shows that the counting variable does not have to increment in single integers. This next example shows how to embed an if statement inside a for loop. So here the idea is that the for loop runs 10 times, and at each iteration of the loop, the code will test whether the modulus of the looping variable is equal to 0. The modulus is the remainder of a number after dividing th the first number by the second number. So here we divide each number 1 through 10 by 2 and test whether the result is 0. This is a way to determine whether this number is odd or even. And then the result of that test is printed out. I encourage you to explore this piece of code a bit more, try with different uh, input values here, and become comfortable with using the mod function. It's a pretty handy tool. So now we can run it. This example here shows several features of for loops. First is that I've embedded one for loop inside another for loop. So let's think carefully about what happens inside this loop. In the first iteration of this outer loop, i equals 1. And then there's a loop that goes for j equals 3 to 7. So for one iteration of this outer loop, the inner loop gets run five times. And then the outer loop changes its value from i equals 1 to i equals 2. And then this inner loop is run another five times, and so on. So in total, this line of code gets evaluated 25 times. If you look at this product matrix, you'll see that it contains two columns of zeros in the beginning. That's because we only specified from the third column on what the result should be. And MATLAB automatically fills in the unspecified elements of this matrix with zeros. You can also see that this variable is underlined, which indicates a warning. And if you look at the warning message, it will tell you that this matrix is growing in size on each iteration. This is memory inefficient and could cause problems or confusions later on in the code. So the right thing to do is to initialize this variable before starting the loop. And this initialization you can see in the next example. First, I specify the number of rows, and I specify the number of columns. And then I can initialize the product matrix to be a zeros matrix containing this number of rows and this number of columns. And now inside this double loop, the product matrix is populated. Initialization is an important way of avoiding mistakes or letting bugs get into your code. You should get into the habit of initializing matrices whenever possible. For one thing, initializing matrices will force you to think in advance about exactly how big these matrices should be. And as I've said before, the more you think about your code before writing it, 
the more efficient your code will be and the lower the chance of making errors. Another feature of this embedded loop is the two looping variable names. Here I call them i and j, but these are actually terrible names for looping variables. The problem is that they're not informative, they're not meaningful. So for this little toy example with only one line of code, it's not really such a problem. But imagine if you had dozens or hundreds of lines of code inside this loop, and maybe some additional embedded control statements. It would be really easy to forget what i and j stand for. So you should always use meaningful looping variable names. In this case, i and j correspond to rows and columns, so I think a uh, better naming would be row i and call i. So now I know that this corresponds to the row looping index, and this corresponds to the column looping index. And of course, I have to change everything here. And maybe I'll put in some spaces to make it a bit clearer. I always end my looping variables with i. This is part of my programming style, and it lets me know which variables are looping indices. Notice also that after each end statement, I write a little comment indicating which loop this is ending. So in fact, this should also be updated. This is finish column loop and finish row loop. Again, with this little example of a few lines of code, it doesn't matter. But you can imagine that if you had 400 lines of code with three or four embedded loops, it would be really easy to get confused. So these little comments here after the end statement can become really helpful. I have another example here to illustrate an error that is commonly made when creating for loops. You can pause the video and try and figure out why this code is producing an error and how to fix it. The problem here is that I'm trying to index the minus threeth element of this vector, which doesn't exist. So there's several ways to fix a bug like this. One solution is to define the looping numbers first, and that will allow us to initialize this vector in a more soft-coded way. So I'm going to write, uh, let's say these are the numbers to use, and I'll say this is minus 3 to 3. And now I can say a vec gets initialized to the length of numbers to use. And now here, I, instead of going from minus 3 to plus 3, it would go from 1 to length numbers to use. And then here I have to make sure that this I really want to be i, but this I don't want to be i per se. I want this to be the ith index in numbers to use. So this should be numbers to use i. Finally, i is not a very useful um, looping index name, so Instead, I'm going to call this numI, because that's what it refers to, the number. So I think this code is now much better than it was before, and it won't produce any errors. So in this video, I introduced you to for loops. I showed you how they work. I showed you several examples of for loops. I discussed good practice coding to improve your MATLAB programming style. And I showed some errors that are common with for loops and how to avoid them.